there's been a narrative across the college football landscape that I think we need to address right now. And the narrative is, hey, we're about halfway through the college football season and there hasn't really been any good teams. Like I was talking to a buddy of mine the other day and he was saying, listen, man, I don't, I don't see a team that's like Georgia last year. I don't see a team that's, you know, just far and away the team when it comes to college football this year. And there's been this chatter of, are there, are there no good teams in college football? Like that was kind of the headline that was hyperbolic in nature. But week three, that was what a lot of people were saying. Hey, nobody's good in college football this year. Everybody left week three feeling slighted and feeling unhappy with their football team. Which kind of begs the question, is that true? Is it really a down year for college football? Or is there more to this than what meets the eye? I happen to think the latter. What I think people mean is when they say there's no good teams in college football is nobody looks dominant, right? Nobody's blowing everybody out by 50 every single weekend like we've seen some teams do in the past and nobody's just rolling through and and is far and away the number one seed in college football. But what I think we're seeing there, like I said, lack of dominance, but also the usual suspects have got a lot of new right now. Like think about it, the big brands, the Georgias, the Alabamas, the Ohio States, A lot of new for them right now. Georgia, new quarterback, new offensive coordinator. Ohio State, new quarterback, new offensive coordinator in the offensive coordinator position. Brian Hartline has been passed the keys from Ryan Day. All right, Alabama, new quarterback, new offensive coordinator, new defensive coordinator. You say, Jody, what about Michigan? Well, Michigan's not getting any buzz because they haven't played anybody of note. Like, we, we have not broken down one game for you when it comes to what Michigan's doing week in and week out. Why? Because they've played nobody. Like, it is what it is. Nebraska has been the most, you know, appealing opponent for us to talk about with Michigan. And even then, it's like, hey, Michigan's probably going to roll. No, we're not doing a Michigan Bowling Green segment here. Just, like, it is what it is. Michigan's great, but they're not in the spotlight. They're not a conversation piece because we don't have a filter to assess them with just yet. So I think that's more the thing is there's not as much dominance but there's a lot of new pieces within college football right now. And the other part of that is the teams that have been fringe teams for a while, like the teams that have always been talked about as like that next ring outside of the elites that have been, you know, hopefully trending upward and they're always around the, hey, could they be a dark horse team this year conversation? They're now very firmly in the mix of being college football playoff contenders. I'm talking about the Texases. I'm talking about the Florida States. I'm talking about the Ole Misses. Like those teams are very much so in, in, in the conversation in the college football playoff race. And so instead of us saying, oh, wow, hey, that's, th- those teams are for real. Instead, we say, well, if those teams are, are rolling, well, then college football must be down. Because in our minds, we can't get rid of that snapshot of these teams being subpar and missing expectations and at the 11th hour not following through on what we thought they would do like we're slow to trust these teams for a reason because of what history has taught us about these teams but we can't for whatever reason take seriously that they are legitimately good football teams and they could compete for a college football playoff so that's where our mind is at with all this it's a little bit of a how you process it and through the lens that you view this through situation, I think, for some of us when it comes to the college football landscape. So what is actually happening? Why are we actually thinking this right now? Why is this actually a conversation? Well, the reason why I think this, or the reason what I think is, or we'll rephrase that. What is actually happening in my mind is the truth about the college football landscape right now is somewhere in the middle. Like, does Georgia look dominant right now? No. Were they really that dominant this time last year? No. Had a comeback win against Missouri. That Kent State box score left something to be desired from that team. What did they do? Won the national title and scored over 60 points doing it. It was a blowout in every sense. They were dominant then. They weren't super dominant early in the year. Is Alabama rolling right now? No. But looks like they're starting to trend the right way. What I saw against Mississippi State was encouraging. What I saw against Ole Miss was encouraging. It's only week six. Like, can we understand that? It's only week six. Is it more likely that there are no good teams in college football or college football is down? Or is it potentially true that we have several good teams and some teams that are actually going to be really good in November are kind of finding their footing right now and are breaking in some new pieces and still developing? I don't think we can just ride off some of these teams that are having issues early as no good. 
And when I say issues, I mean, you see Georgia down to South Carolina. You see them down to Auburn. You see Alabama lose to Texas. Like, why can't we just say Texas is really good? Why can't we just say, hey, Auburn had a great game plan for Georgia that day and Georgia found a way to win? Like, we're, we're very slow to give some of these teams that end up winning the football game in an ugly fashion their flowers. Instead, we want to, we want to look at their mistakes and say, yeah, well, that's, that's not going to fly in November. Who's to say that's still there in November? Who's to say they're the same team in November as they are in September? And I keep going back to Georgia because I think they're kind of the poster child for this whole conversation, but I think it's 100% true. I think it's 100% the case is that's how we're assessing them. We're assessing them by their mistakes that we see early in the year. And that's not just Georgia. I mean, you can go down the line here and say that's Ohio State. We've been guilty of that on this show. You can talk about Bama. We've been guilty of that on this show as well. Florida State, who knows what they're going to be, but so far they've been looking like they're a team that could be in that college football playoff conversation, but they haven't been in that tier one the last couple of years, so we're slow to trust. Like, as college football fans, we have trust issues. It's okay. It's 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 not anything that's unique to the the world as a whole. Like, everybody's got trust issues, but I think part of this is we have to start to learn to trust that this is a, a, a trend over time. This is a progression Again, what you are in September is not what you are in November. So where I stand with this is I have confidence that the best organizations, meaning the talent, the coaching, the the best schematics as a whole, the best processes, those will eventually rise in November. Like Ohio State in November will be better than they are right now. Michigan in November, they'll be better than they are right now. Georgia, same thing. Like all these teams, all these coaches rather that we've grown to trust over time, they're the head coach there for a reason. They've recruited what they've recruited for a reason. They develop how they develop for a reason. We got to trust that a little bit and understand that what we see in in week five isn't what they're going to be again in November. What I think we should say though is the fact that we've got a lot of really good teams right now is going to make for a phenomenal college football playoff race. Like, getting to talk about Texas in that mix, getting to talk about Florida State in that mix right now, how awesome is that? How awesome is that? Because that was the complaint for so many people, and that was the reason, that was the rallying cry for a lot of these people behind the 12-team playoff is, we want more parity. We want more parity. You want more parity? We got more parity right now. And it's still in the four-team era. I w- I, it would be so poetic for this to be the year before they blow up the four-team playoff for a two-loss team to make the college football playoff. Wouldn't that just be, wouldn't that just be exactly what we deserve at this point? I think so. So to recap it, are there really no good teams in college football? Or is it maybe just maybe a fact that there's a lot of good teams in college football and we're seeing great competition and we're seeing some teams that have been on the outside looking in now firmly within the conversation and it's making for some great games. Maybe some of the big boys are breaking in some new pieces at really important spots. That's the way that I would look at it. But again, this is the greatest movie that we get to watch in real time that is college football. Let's enjoy it. Let's not be down on these different teams saying they're no good, they're no good, they're no good. Like, it's week six. Let's let it bake. Let's let it play out. Let's enjoy the entire process of it. That's where I fall on the matter. Prize picks is bringing y'all the hard count. And prize picks is daily fantasy. It's super fun to play. If you use code JD, they will match your deposit up to 100 bucks, 100%. Okay, so you put down 50. Prize picks says, great, you're redeeming code JD. Awesome. We'll match you with our own $50. That's $100 to play with. And we're off to the races. So our prize picks this week is a little bit of a smaller slate with what we're rolling with. We've gone right around six squares the last couple of weeks. We're shrinking it down to five. And instead of flexing it, we're just going power play, which means we got to hit on all three of these squares to get anything out of this. But when we hit on all three of these, we 5X what we put down. All right, so without further ado, here's what we like. Quinn Ewers, his square number is two and a half passing, rushing, or receiving touchdowns. We like the more on that. We think Oklahoma is going to be aggressive on defense. We think Quinn Ewers is going to deal the pill around the yard like a shady pharmacist. We think these weapons for Texas get loose, and we think this is a high-scoring affair. Whether it's rushing or whether it's throwing, if he catches a touchdown, I mean, hey, that counts too. But we like the more there for two and a half touchdowns for Quinn Ewers. Jason McClellan, they're giving us half a rushing touchdown. We'll say, hey, thank you very much. We'll take it. Good defensive front protect from Texas A&M, but we know Alabama. They want to run the football. I think Jason McClellan is starting to kind of come into his own as well. 
we think that this hits will take the half rushing touchdown will take the more now Caleb Williams this is a tricky one and this this is tough for me because we always root for the more here what do you what, what do we say every single week on this show we root for good things to happen to good people we root for these kids to make big time plays in college football games and have the more on every single square they get here's the tricky part though USC like we just talked about in our last segment of this live show they're playing Arizona what does Arizona do they play smart football Case in point, last week, they limited possessions for Washington last week. I don't think Michael Penix had a, tu- had a touchdown pass last week. Caleb Williams, his number for passing touchdowns this week is three and a half. Now, if he gets enough possessions, could absolutely do it. We're going to kind of zig when everyone else zags here. We're going less on Caleb Williams passing touchdowns of three and a half. He may run for one. He may throw for three. But as long as he doesn't throw for four, that square will hit. So to recap it, Quinn Ewers, more than two and a half total touchdowns against Oklahoma. Jason McClellan, one rushing touchdown. We like that. His number is half rushing touchdown, so we'll take the more against Texas A&M. Caleb Williams, three and a half passing touchdowns against Arizona. We'll take the less, but Caleb, we still root for you to ball out, okay, as we do for every single individual that's playing a college football game this upcoming Saturday. So that's prize picks. Again, redeem code JD. 100% 100% deposit match up to 100 bucks. I promise you it's a blast to play. Safe, easy withdrawal, easy to understand. Get with it, get prize picks, and we will uh, have ourselves a tremendous college football Saturday. Hey, y'all, thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel here to make sure you don't miss an episode of The Hard Count. Also, be sure to check out other videos on the On3 YouTube channel.